All right, let's get going. Um, so uh, we have uh, a lot of questions, and um, while we uh, wait for people to maybe ask a couple more questions from Thais's talk as well, uh, rapid fire a couple of questions from Mo. Sure. Um, I don't think so my I mic is on. Huh? Is my mic on? It's off. Is it on? Can we hear you? Hello? Cool. OK, sorry. <laughs> Great. Um, so I think there was some uh, like confusion around you know the sort of actual technology of mm -hmm. you know this uh, you know implement the app on the web and on on sure. native. I'm assuming since you're using Expo, you're using React Native. Yep. But then there's also some people who are asking like, do these same rules apply when you use a PWA or maybe mm -hmm. if your app isn't a PWA, it's just like a standard website. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, one of the things about using React Native and using Expo means that you do have access to that native implementation layer. So you can call and execute Swift code. So when you call an alert, you're effectively executing Swift code. It becomes more difficult with a PWA. Um, and also with other cross-platform technologies like Flutter, it's a bit more difficult. So the way that alerts are done in Flutter is it mimics the style of how the device alert looks, but it's not actually a real device alert. It's, a, it's just drawn out onto the canvas. Um, and on PWAs as well, you can try to style it according to the platform, but it's going to look... Um, it's gonna, it, you're going to have to do that, and it's not a native implementation. Uh, that being said, there are other technologies that outside of React Native that you can achieve this with. I think if you, if you want to use like Ionic with Capacitor as well, it has some of those native implementations that effectively allow you to call native parts of code uh, and have native UI and UX elements. Nice. And uh, Thais, you had some uh, you know, general rules for different platforms, like for example, using the platform native fonts. Would you recommend this also for web apps? Like if you're building a you know, website PWA, for example, would you still use San Francisco and Roboto on those platforms, or would you go for the yeah, well, in the web, I would say there's a bit more flexibility because the loading of fonts is done a bit easier, and I think that we have more resources on the web um, platforms in general. But the thing about the branding um, of digital products nowadays is that those, the, even if you have a custom font, it doesn't differ so much from these that we see as an example. Lots of designers actually really like San Francisco and Roberto. And even if you choose for something else like Inter as a type font, um, in essence, the message is going to come across the same. So if you do have to give way for performance, then go ahead and implement what is easiest and available. Maybe it, it's more available to have a Google font than your own that you uh, made. So I would say, yeah, try to maybe enhance performance depending on the size of your application. Nice. Um, there's kind of a related question here, which is, what do you think about PWAs in general, and do you think they will replace native in the future? And I think this is interesting because, you know, the PWA capabilities are increasing, the browser capabilities mm -hmm. are increasing. Uh, Safari just shipped, you know, desktop apps for the, for the you know, yeah. on, on PWA. So, like, where do you think that is heading? Like, are native apps still going to be something that we'll be building? Well, to be honest, from an iOS perspective, um, I think they also have a very strong team, right? They well, they re revolutionized the idea of applications. Um, and it might be hard to overwrite this. I'm not so sure about Android, because Android is, is more flexible. It's, it's, it seems a lot like what we experience on web. But that's not from a technical perspective. Mm -hmm. That's just <laughs> from a designer's. It's an interesting point on that. Um, does anyone here know who was the first person who ever came up with the concept of a PWA? No. It was Steve Jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically, it was in the release of the first iPhone, that this idea of web apps that look, sort of like run anywhere and have access to like Ajax frameworks at that point and Ajax uh, APIs at that point, like that was an iPhone invention and then they went down the App Store route to make native apps. Uh, some of those restrictions are being removed as well. Like one of the biggest barriers for why you would choose a native app was to, to send notifications on iOS. You can now do that with PWAs. Um, I think it still doesn't get the same look and feel and that's going to be very difficult to get. I just think it's going to be a while before we get that. And there's so much more that's expanding uh, in the native uh, layer that I think it's going to be a while. There's a bit of catch up left to do. But I mean, that look and feel thing is interesting because, like, Thais's point was that you don't need to make apps look the same. You just mm -hmm. need to make them, you know, behave the same. And obviously, you know, for mobile web, it's still uh, somewhat with a trash fire from, a, you know, like a mm -hmm. actual browser compatibility mm -hmm. point of view, for example. So it's not necessarily easier to build, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mobile web app that works perfectly. Exactly. Um, but is that, you know, so we have so many questions about this, so I don't really know how to, like, oh, summarize them. But actually, just yeah. on that point as well, I think there's a lot of investment from uh, the platforms, um, especially iOS, on the very nuanced interactions that I think will be very hard to mimic yeah. over time. So there's so many details that you don't even notice, but... Like, I changed from having an Android to an iOS, and it's just such a big difference. Like, 
micro interactions, right? And they spend a lot of effort on that. So I wonder if they will be able to mimic with other types of technology. Yeah, and of course, then you have <laughs> other platforms. We have this question here. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a real question, if people are trolling. Uh, <clears throat> in Finland, Nokia Symbian OS is very popular. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Um, I don't know what decade this question is coming from. Is there like a... Sent by Internet Explorer? Uh, yes, yeah. yes. Um, but uh, do you have any design uh, pl patterns wow, for that's Nokia? That's a very Sudan? good point. It even reminds me of Blackberries. Uh, that was yeah. a thing. Uh, yeah, to be honest, uh, from my experience, uh, no, we hardly think about it. And it even goes further from uh, different browsers, right? Uh, it's very common to think about Chrome and everything working nicely in Chrome, like all the, the states and, and different interactions. And sometimes you just have to consider that in, even in Safari, it doesn't behave exactly as the same. And you have to cater for that or design that. So I don't think it's in designers' minds often, unless it's a challenge proposed by the business. Nice. Um, there's one last sort of uh, cross-platform question. This is really just clarifying a point I used to made on your guiding principle to typography. Like even if you have your brand typography, when you go on iOS and Android, you, your recommendation is that you should ignore the brand typography yep. and, and go native. Yeah, and yeah. there are a couple of articles on Medium that you can find about this. They did the research to try to counter the points. Like, is it worth it actually going the extra mile to implement your, your brand's typography. And often the conclusion is, nah, not really. It's just, it, it might impact the performance of your application, and in essence, it can look very similar. The nuances of the font, unless you're using Comic Sans, which I highly doubt <laughs> it, <laughs> then you're probably okay with defaulting to the native from platforms. Nice, okay, let's jump into more uh, process, sort of like higher level questions. Uh, so there's a question here. Um, some designers I've worked with have rejected design systems because they restrict creativity. Um, how would you convince such designers to embrace systems? What do you think, Mo? How would you convince? You're the designer. How do we convince you? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, the problem is I work with design systems, so I'm already convinced. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what I like to usually say, it's about you should be focusing on the experience and not the UI. Although UI is a big part of your end product and you do want to put some effort into that, I think the magic of the digital product is going to come from the steps that the user takes to get from A to B or yeah, the, the little interactions. The design system is there to speed up some of the concepts and, and get you quicker into market. So I think there's a lot more benefits in regards to the efficiency and time spent. And the creativity really, when you have challenges and when you have boundaries, I think it's when we become more creative. Yeah. If you have a blank canvas, well, pff, good luck, <laughs> you know. And at least uh, design systems provides you um, some guidance and, and mm -hmm. rules. But it's important that they are available for you to, to know how to decide for things. Just having the component library and without much explanation or help from the design system team to know what to use when, it might feel limiting because you might think, oh, but I really wanted that thing. So yeah, the, the documentation and guidance side of things is what I think enhances the experience with design systems. Um, try to tell them, you know, we're not limiting you, we're giving you challenges to overcome. <laughs> I mean, so this is from a, this is my personal question, but uh, w one of the sort of uh, difficulties in sort of uh, with this process, I think, is especially when you're a super small team. Let's say you're one designer and one developer, or maybe that is even the same person, the designer and developer, right? Um, and you yet don't really know what is it that you're building. You know, you're iterating this very much like you're building a very much of an MVP. You know, mm -hmm. you have a basic idea of what the feature that is going to be. It's very hard to formalize, you know, what is it that the, that the system is going to be. So this ties into a question um, here is, when is the right time to formalize a design system for a Greenfield app? Like, do you, would you always start from day one? You know, like when you open your Figma file, the first mm. thing you do is you create your button base and your design tokens, or is there like a more sort of like a, like a creative free flux um, sort of like process first that then gets sort of nailed down? I find it easier to start with a library. So I'm not gonna start with the design system because the design system includes documentation guidelines. It's not just about the components. Um, but I definitely look for maybe a more like headless um, design system that is available to me so that I don't have to recreate th those buttons. And I, it, because it feels like every time I'm having to make new inputs again or come up with uh, new checkboxes again, like it's been done before. I just need to represent a checkbox. 
Um, so it's easier if you do start. And for the times, for example, personally, when I didn't start with the library, then you're 50 screens down the line, and you need to change that one thing in all those 50s. Yeah. And yes, you have to select them all again, change it one by one. So much easier if it's done at the source. Mm -hmm. I, I think another, the, the, the way that I've started, and I think this worked really well, was you start from completely like base level f wireframes, and you start with no UI in it, just UX. You focus on the UX. You'll start to see the patterns, and then the components naturally bubble up from that. Um, I think it's worthwhile starting with design tokens, though. Yeah. Just for that refactor, refactoring that will inevitably come. It's naturally going to come. So you start that, you use a headless UI library, add some design tokens into it, and then you're kind of set in a nice space with a greenfield application to be able to build and iterate on it onwards. Yeah, I mean, I guess like once it lands the, to the developer's desk, even if it's the same person, you know, mm -hmm. at some point you go, yeah. oh, I already have a button. I don't want to implement another exactly. button. You know, uh, there needs to be some rules around yeah. how, how that works. So how many buttons is acceptable? If you have a code base and it has different button components, like when do you, when do you draw the line and go, you people are out of line? Well, from the code base, I'm not sure. Uh, how many different props can you have for a variance <laughs> of a button? Yeah. Um, every single additional prop is an added level of complexity for development, for design, and also for the user. Like you're adding more cognitive load to what they recognize as a button. Um, I usually try to push back on this quite heavily. It's a personal opinion. I think you should limit the variance. But um, yeah, no, I agree. Um, and Figma is also evolving to thinking very much components uh, like, yeah. and we uh, end up having the same loads of variants to represent that one element, uh, just because you want to give all the options that you could have on when designing a new interface. But the more complex, then more maintenance, and probably your users for the design system, your designer colleagues or developer colleagues, they will just look at that as like, Nah, can't be bothered. Too much complex, complexity. I'm, I'm going to yeah. move forward. Each added variant is also going to have diminishing returns. Like, how much extra value are you giving your user by having a slightly different shade of a button? Like, not much. And so you kind of start to realize that. I think both the design and the development team will both start to realize that kind of like simultaneously. But, but I mean, I think this kind of goes back to the question earlier. I don't remember what the wording mm -hmm. was exactly, but about restricting creativity, right? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. like there's this, you know, same as like programmers want to program, you know, designers yep. going to want to design. Uh, like at some point you have to go for the practical kind of route where you maybe don't get to be so sort of like micro level sort of individual contributor creative mm -hmm. and you need to think more in, in, in larger exactly. systems. Yeah. But at, at points it is important to push back because not everything should be a component as well. Um, for example, you might only see that element in that one user flow. So it doesn't make sense to now start bloating your design system with all amazing components, so 150 different components, just when you see it in one screen. Maybe it makes sense that it lives there. And down the line, if you need to reuse that element that you saw on that screen, you just sort of um, pu push it to the design system library. And then it becomes part of the design system. So it's important to yeah, try to keep a balance. Nice. All right. Um, let's jump into some different questions for a while. So um, here's a question about the design tokens community group file format. Are you both familiar with this? Yes. Any thoughts? Well, I think they're doing... Oh, maybe we could actually define it for the audience first. Yeah. I think maybe not everybody <laughs> actually, knows that's, what this That's is. a good point. By the audience, I mean myself. <laughs> <laughs> WC3 uh, work group is uh, getting together, and these are like designers and developers that are leads in the industry uh, coming up with, okay, what is design tokens, and how th should the format look like? And in essence, it should be a JSON file, yeah. but with a certain structure that can be understood by all uh, different technologies. And that's a very light way to put it, right? Would you? I think so, yeah. And, and one of the nice things about it is it's very like agnostic to like tech or design. Like it, it's got types in it, and the types are sort of like very abstract concepts. And I think it's the right step to take. Like style dictionary in some capacity has been filling in that gap. Yep. And I think this is the natural like evolving. I think it needs to be standardized. If we have so many different platforms that we target, it just makes sense. The way I like to see design tokens is just this um, common language, really, between design and development. Um, so designers need the hex values and the font families um, that they choose uh, very carefully. And developers, they just need to know, OK, tell me what it is. I, I don't care that, what, that, what is the value of the hex value. So the design tokens come as that um, middle ground that everybody knows what they're talking about and when you define it in a format that any team across the world understands then it becomes something more adoptable and I guess the comparison is 
towards like what CSS eventually grew up, grew up, uh, grew into in terms of um, how would you call it like consistency. Yeah, and I guess also it helps us build tooling, right? When we have standards, because one of the things I think we didn't sort of like very much detail touch here is that you know all of the examples that we had were you know React Native code, for example. Mm -hmm. But like design tokens can also be used by like native iOS developers and yeah. developers, exactly. or even native Symbian developers, in fact. Um, yeah. And yeah, so I think that's where it sort of like becomes you know, super important that you have mm -hmm. some interoperability layer. And, and before design tokens, like, we would uh, give a screen design, and the developer would look at that blue and be like, oh, okay, I think this is, oh, which hex is this again? Yeah. And hard code that value in, into their development process. And for the long term, uh, if you need to update your brand, if you need to actually just change uh, nuance because of accessibility, now you have to chase that uh, hard coded value. And when it's done in design tokens, it's just changed in one place. And it, you can never do it. You end up with 160 different text colors. Yep. It's not possible. Like, feasibly, it's going to be very difficult to get rid of that inconsistency. Nice. All right. Um, well, so we have uh, five more questions here currently, unless you submit more. But they all really don't have a theme. So I'm just going to like rapid fire these questions completely uh, <laughs> apropos. Um, so I think this one is for Thais. Um, any library or pattern to gather user feedback? You spoke about user feedback being one of the things. Um, we have only one designer at work. He can't conduct interviews himself. Yep. Any way software can help here? Um, well, in the design process, creating prototypes, uh, if you're using Figma, it's fairly easy. And I would just send it out even on LinkedIn, for example, and try to get some feedback that way. So there is some, let's say, guerrilla user testing that it might not be as qualitative that you might uh, get the results that are very deep insights, but it, it gets you going quickly. And actually, even with the LinkedIn example, you've probably have seen it uh, if you have a couple of designers that you follow. They put like two screens and they go like thumbs up for option A or smiley face for option B. That's a way of doing user testing to some extent, uh, at least to see users' preferences. So I think, yeah, there are, you, you can just Google for like gorilla <laughs> user testing <laughs> and that will help you with some ideas on how to be quick. And of course, if you're in a environment of a good user testing um, infrastructure with proper researchers that set up like a calendar and a program for your application, then it's great. But the reality of most small teams is just put it in the hands even of your parents, say, and see how they behave. It's always good to, because it's, hard, it's easy for us to fall in the trap thinking that we are the user. And so we end up uh, imposing our own preferences in the application. And it's much better when you actually get to see people who never saw it interact with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I would inject my own opinion here. I'm not a designer, but I've worked with you know, various sizes of teams. If your designer doesn't have time to talk to users, interact with users, gather research, they're probably focusing on the wrong thing. Like obviously there's many workplaces in which design is underfunded, you know, like you have one designer to 10 developers and all they need to do is churn out, you know, UI. But like that is the, the heart of what a designer does, right? And what the whole team should be doing. So if your designer doesn't have time to, um, you know, talk to users, uh, and the question here was can any software help? Well, maybe, but the developer can also help. Mm -hmm. Developers can talk to the users. You know, like if your organization is set up in a way that you as developers are not talking to your users, I think that is an organizational problem that you should probably look into. It, even in the consulting business, just to reiterate and push on this point, one of the key factors that we look up about the health of a project is how many times every other week we're getting user feedback. So in our sprints, if we're not getting consistent user feedback, and that can be collected by the dev, it can be collected by a product person, then there's a high chance of failure for that project. And we, like, we've seen this time and time again. So it's so vital for devs or for designers. Nice. Uh, all right, let's do a couple of quick ones. Um, oh, more questions coming in. That's nice. Um, uh, where did they go? Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, well, this one is fun for, for Mo. Actually, I wondered about this. So at your first slide, you showed the number, how many colors mm -hmm. are, for example, used at Stripe or Amazon. How do you collect that? That one has actually been uh, published in a blog article by Adam Wantham, um, who's the creator of Tailwind. Um, so all credits to him. The, that, that was from his blog article. Nice. All right. Quick uh, yes, no, I don't know question. Uh, is there a plugin like this Figma token um, sort of sync thing for Marvel or other tools? I haven't seen anything. We don't, don't know. Um, a couple of accessibility questions uh, popping up here. So for, for Thais, accessibility in design systems, thoughts? And then there's a related question, 
is it possible to inform accessibility rules across platforms via universal design systems? If anything, I think that there is another argument for having design systems is that you can then implement accessibility rules from the base, so on your foundation of your application. Because, for example, in web, when you define a button with accessibility requirements that um, the coded piece already requires an alt text, um, alt? Yeah, an alt text to make it accessible, for example. Or um, that your mobile components also include that specific interaction. When it's baked in the design system, the end products will be accessible to an extent. So I, I definitely think it's possible and it should be part of the process of creating new components to have the accessibility requirements done and documented as well, which is often overlooked because there's no, not enough time. So classical problem, but definitely it's the future as well. I think uh, we need to be more inclusive to all sorts of uh, yeah, challenges that people face in their different uh, yeah. devices. What do you think, Mo, about? Nothing more to add to that. I think it was very comprehensive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'll inject here saying that the most sort of uh, impactful accessibility practice that I have built is basically just starting a component library with, uh, with a headless uh, component library that already supports you know, accessibility out of the box. Mm -hmm. yep. Some like Radix UI, React Aria, yeah. you know, the similar ones. Yeah. Shush uh, CD, no, what is it? Shush CN. Whatever. I'm not um, sure. There, there, there's tons of these, but the whole idea here is that basically, you know, you can only really build your components accessibility mm -hmm. first. It kind of guides you to the pit of success. So. Yeah. yeah. And also design tokens, again, for the win, because um, a lot of the accessibility issues are to do with color contrasts. And if these uh, colors that are needed in the application are done in tokens format, mm -hmm. and you encounter those accessibility issues down the line, you can always revert it back, change it in that one place, and you get your application, again, in a good state for accessibility. There's some really great profilers for Android where you open up an app and it like generates a report on how well your color scheme is like for accessibility reasons. So would recommend looking at that as a starting point if you want to go down that route as well for, for colors specifically. Yeah, I mean, we, we've had great accessibility talks at, at React Finland before, so if you go to the back, back, past years in, uh, on, on YouTube, um, I think you'll be able to find those there. Um, we're going back to the theme of, uh, of this uh, cross-platform and sort of like customizability, and sorry, like, you know, brand versus, you know, platform. But I think this is an interesting question that is maybe more philosophical. So why do you say users get confused if designs look different on mobile, while on web different designs are, you know, the norm, right? Like every website looks different. There really isn't like UX interaction patterns like this. Should websites become more similar to each other? Like, should we make websites more boilerplate sort of uh, standard? Or is there space for mobile apps to have more diverse, you know, sort of like well, experiences? I'm, I'm not sure if I agree that websites are very different because in the end, when we think about buttons, inputs, they all are very similar in interaction and even look. And when you come across a website that does try to be completely crazy and, and give you an input that doesn't look like an input, you will often find users being confused. Like, where am I supposed to fill in my name? It doesn't look like it's a box I should be typed in, typing in. So I think, um, yeah, user confusion in terms of what's available or what you can do on web, because there is so much flexibility of what you can visually make it different in web, it's risky. You, you might want to standardize, and I think we do actually in general standardize. And of course, if you're talking about websites that are a lot more visual, um, like galleries or you know portfolios, then it's a, it's a different thing. But when we talk about um, digital products, then yes, it, it's already similar. Yeah, I, I think there's also something really interesting about the way you use your uh, phone, because you know, your phone, you multitask by like switching between apps, and you basically want the UI controls kind of be in the place so your like, mm. you know, thumb memory you know, sort of finds them, especially on iOS, this is like highly, you know, pronounced, right? Like where the UI controls are yeah. always like in the same part of the screen. So I think there's also something about the way people use websites, you know, they're in different headspace or different mm -hmm. context when they use a different website. When I'm on Amazon or Spotify, I have a highly different, you know, mindset. Whereas yeah. an app I'm flipping through, like phone, I'm flipping through mm -hmm. 30 apps a second, you know, to uh, basically always end up on Twitter at the end anyway. <laughs> All right, let's do a final question. Um, so this is from a developer point of view. Uh, we are currently implementing a design system. Um, you know, the offerings ready to go, um, I'm not really sure, regardless front-end frameworks, but the, I think the question is, 
it is really hard to promote within developers. So I guess like, mm -hmm. you know, design system, you know, like actually like cascading this into the organization. Mm -hmm. Any comments, any tips? I think if you create a nice pipeline out of it and create nice processes for it, it actually takes weight off of developers and lets developers develop things that are interesting to them. Like you don't want to get design requests and slight modifications for like UI, UI components and you want to have a, li a, a language by which you can say, I want a button here. Okay, we already have a button, let's just do it. And like let's implement it in this specific way if you've already got a UI library defined or the colors are defined and you don't have to spend time trying to figure out what color the designer means that you need to use. I think it's, it's, a, it's a mental burden off the head of the developer. So I think if it's implemented correctly, if there's the right automation set into place, it's actually quite powerful for developers. But I guess the question is that, you know, you have all of this mm -hmm. and yet those pesky developers aren't biting. You know, like what, how do you actually communicate this? Like what, have you ever seen a successful uh, deployment of a design system by Fiat where you just basically tell people you use this or, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've seen it like that. <laughs> But um, from my experience, it was also about uh, the end customer. So especially if you're handling uh, B2B kind of uh, products, it's really tough not to have the design system in place because uh, normally you're developing something that looks a certain way, but when it's implemented in your customer's uh, scenario, in your other, the business that you're selling it to, they need to implement their brand into, on top of your product. And yeah, you're asking them to either refactor everything so they can actually change that blue or change that uh, typography, or you provide them with an, um, a very simple set of design tokens and components that can be readjusted as they're implementing the product. So in the scenario of a B2B, you kind of like have no alternative but to have a design system when working with white label applications. Mm -hmm. And I would say also the design and development handover it's much easier to get a Figma file that you can just select elements on that page and you know that that's a button that also is equivalent to a button that exists in code. So you don't have to rethink the logic behind that button and you can think about the logic of the application instead. Cool. I think that, I mean, we do have time because we are a bit early, but we are out of questions. So I think we'll let people uh, uh, to enjoy an extra long coffee break. Mo, uh, there's a request for you. Can you please share the GitHub repo for the demo? Yes. Um, so a friend of mine has actually created some of this. She, uh, her name is Deb, Deb Ornalis. I'll share that um, maybe on Slack with everyone. Uh, she's got a starter repo. It doesn't convert to Tailwind, but it converts to CSS. So it's, it's just for a normal web app, but it should give you an idea of what you need to set up. So I'll just share that. All right, well, let's all give big thanks to Mo and Thais. Thank you.